Okay, super. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to our next talk from the Complexity Workshop. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, Benny Yoshida from Perimeter Institute, who's going to tell us about remarks on black hole complexity puzzles. So Benny, please take it away. Okay, so yes, for giving me an opportunity to speak today, and uh, um, well, yeah. I'm sorry for people who are listening or watching this at a very odd time of the day due to time difference. Um, anyway, so today uh, I will discuss a certain uh, conceptual puzzle concerning uh, um, black hole complexity. So roughly speaking, the puzzle is as follows. Um, so the given a generic boundary CFT wave function, it is extremely difficult task to determine its quantum circuit complexity. On the other hand, the volume of the one is a puzzle because the same computational task appears to be very easy on the bulk and very difficult on the boundary. Now, this puzzle was uh, originally pointed out by Bolan, Hefferman, and Vazirani, and then there are two other uh, follow up papers on this subject. Now, in Benny? today's talk, yes. Sorry to interrupt, uh, but it, it appears that. Okay, go ahead, Benny. Okay, so uh, basically, so we have a puzzle. Uh, volume is easy, but the complexity is difficult on the boundary. And then that is a puzzle. And then in today's talk, I would like to uh, present a possible resolution of this puzzle. And uh, this talk is based on the uh, most recent paper of mine, but uh, uh, key quantum info theoretic techniques have been already developed in my previous papers. So I would like to just summarize my resolution um, first. I will claim that um, proposed protocols to measure the volume efficiently on the bulk are actually not feasible. And this is due to gravitational bulk reaction from bulk observers. So I will simply argue that predictions or protocols based on naive bulk descriptions just simply break down. But in order to argue this point as concretely as possible, I will actually construct uh, explicit, I, I, I will present the explicit construction of interior pattern operator or Hawking or entangled pattern operator with bulk reaction properly taken into account. And by doing this, I will show that actually interior operators are dynamically changing due to back reaction from an impulling observer. Now, uh, these claims are actually based on a very simple but powerful uh, quantum information theoretic theorem, which I will call the black hole decoupling theorem. And uh, this theorem relates out of time order the correlation function or scrambling phenomena to the decoupling phenomena, which I will explain later. So here is the plan of the talk. Um, First, I will briefly review the puzzle. Now, I will keep this part very brief because um, there have been already talks on this topic. And then the main part of the talk, I will discuss interior reconstruction. Then I will discuss resolu resolution and then conclude with uh, discussions, okay? So let me begin with the puzzle. Okay, so quantum extended church Turing thesis, which I will just call the thesis, is the following physical belief or proposal. All the physical processes that obey fundamental law of physics, including quantum gravity, are efficiently similable on a quantum computer. Now, a thesis is a proposal for a sake of argument, so it is not a proven statement. But this thesis is interesting because if this thesis is wrong, then it could mean that uh, quantum gravity effect may speed up quantum computation, right? So then the ADS CFT correspondence appears to be a prime setup to test this thesis because it says that uh, all the physical phenomena happening on ADS bulk are encoded into a boundary quantum mechanical systems, which may be simulated on a quantum computer. So the contraposition of this thesis within the ADS-CFT correspondence is the following. Uh, any 
physical processes that cannot be efficiently simulated in boundary CFT cannot be simulated on bulk areas quantum gravity. So it just simply say that uh, uh, quantum gravity does not speed up quantum computation. So the difficult problem on the boundary should remain difficult on the bulk. Of course, this is a conjecture, but uh, it seems that it is a widely believed conjecture. However, uh, very recently, a uh, very interesting challenge to this puzzle was given by uh, Boland, Pfefferman, and Badrani. Now, um, because I want to keep this part brief, so I might not be able to address their full intent, but very roughly speaking, their argument is as follows. Uh, given a generic wave function, uh, it is very difficult to determine its circuit complexity. All the best we can do is to apply a bunch of quantum gates and see if it will be returned to uh, some simple state, like product state. But this is usually exponential, has exponential complexity. On the other hand, uh, determining the volume of the wormhole appears to be very easy. Now, uh, they actually didn't give us uh, details of how we measure the volume. But uh, roughly speaking, the idea is to populate the wormhole uh, with a bunch of bulk observers. And then these bulk observers uh, tries to communicate with each other by sending signals and then like nearest neighbors. And then roughly speaking, uh, the number of successful signal transmission will be a, a course estimate of the length of the wormhole or volume of the wormhole. Um, in any cases, the point is that uh, this thesis seems to be violated. And uh, several months later, uh, after this paper appeared, uh, Saskin made another uh, challenge to this uh, thesis. So his argument is based on the observation that is uh, determining, uh, determining whether the complexity is actually increasing in increasing or decreasing in time is also difficult. And I guess this makes sense because complexity itself is very difficult to compute. However, uh, Saskin uh, went on further and then made the following claim that is determining whether the volume is increasing or decreasing is, also, is actually very easy. In order to argue this point, uh, uh, let us consider, uh, in order to understand his claim, um, let us consider the following setup. So here we have the thermal field double state, which is a dual to two-sided ADS black hole. And I took time zero at these locations, exploiting the symmetry of the system. Now we think of a time evolving the system on the right-hand side. Then you can probably easily see that the complexity of volume is increasing in time. On the other hand, let us consider a similar state, but with a perturbation already added on the lower bottom corner of the left-hand side. Then it turns out that, well, after some thought, you can convince yourself that the uh, um, complexity or the volume of the wormhole is actually decreasing in time. Anyhow, the important lesson here is that uh, depending on the uh, absence or presence of a perturbations, the complexity can be uh, increasing or decreasing in time. Okay, so, so far it's a very, I think, uh, reasonable and uh, uh, observations, but then uh, he went on further and they made the following claim, that is uh, uh, whether the complexity is, or the volume is increasing or decreasing can be easily detected by an uh, infalling observer. And then the, his claim is basically an infalling observer who jump into the black hole, from the right-hand side of the black hole, we'll be able to see a perturbation or the shock wave that is coming from the other side of the black hole. Then by simply jumping into the black hole, this infalling observer can solve um, this very difficult problem very easily. Okay, so anyhow, again, the uh, thesis seemed to be violated. Okay, so now from the way I'm talking about probably people already noticed that I'm going to argue that the thesis is actually not violated. Um, instead, these protocols are actually not working. But uh, before making serious arguments, uh, I would like to give brief pre preliminary comments. First comment is that when an observer approaches the horizon, she will of course introduce huge back reaction. 
then it is of course a reasonable possibility to suspect that the proposed protocols may become invalid due to back reaction. And then I will indeed argue that this is the case. And the second point is um, in two-sided black hole, then two sides of the black hole are not coupled to each other. It's actually very well, extremely weird to think that the um, observer from the right-hand side will encounter a perturbation from the left-hand side. Okay, so if you naively look at the Penrose diagram, then it seems like two signals from two sides collide or intersect inside a black hole. But this severely contra contradict with the fact that the two sides of the black hole on the boundary are not coupled. Then it is, I think, a reasonable thing to suspect that maybe there is some, due to some hidden reason, that these two signals actually cannot encounter inside the black hole at all. Then I will actually argue that this is the case. But in order to argue these two points, um, uh, my strategy will be the following. I will first look at boundary quantum mechanics carefully and then construct what are the interior degree of freedom with back reaction taken into consideration. And then by using this information, I will deduce correct bulk effective descriptions. That will be my strategy. Okay, so now let me move on to the main part of my talk, the interior reconstruction. So the main goal of this part is to discuss the back reaction from an infolding observer on the black hole interior geometry. For simplicity of discussion, I will represent the black hole as uh, n copies of EPR pairs supported on B and B bar. Yeah, B is the black hole, and you could call B bar as the other side of the black hole or R radiation. Now, in this situation, of course, it is obvious that uh, you can find the partner mode on the other side of the black hole because B and B bar are entangled. Now, let's imagine that some measurement probe or inforing observer Alice is dropped toward the black hole at time t equals to zero. Then here, I want to study the response of the black hole to this inclusion of the infolding observer. It is of course possible to study this physics for each possible initial state of Alice. Well, Alice can be any quantum state, so we could do that. But instead of keeping track of each initial state of the infolding observer and its outcome, it is actually more convenient to append the so-called reference system, A bar. And here I will put some maximally entangled state like EPR pair between A bar and A. Then by doing this, uh, A bar actually uh, keeps track of uh, what was the quantum state A was. So A bar plays the role of like bookkeeping. Anyhow, so this is the initial state I'm going to consider at time equals to zero. Okay, so it's, well, it's just a bunch of EPR pairs. Now, uh, the system evolves under some unitary operator U, the unitary dynamic, dynamics of the black hole. Then after the time evolution, we will get the following wave function. Now here, uh, D represents an outgoing mode that is hitting the boundary at some specific time, radius boundary at some specific time T. And the C is just the rest of the degree of freedom. Now, our question is the following. Um, what is the partner mode or entangled partner mode of D? Now, in the absence of the infolding observer, of course, D should be entangled with the other side of the black hole, right? Because it was maximally entangled. And in this Penrose diagram, you can identify such a, a partner mode on the other side of the black hole. And uh, we could call it RD, that is like right-hand side D or radiation D, but it's on the other side. But now we have added infolding observer. Then the question is, um, what is the degree of freedom D is entangled with in this situation? Now, it turns out that, so this is the problem I want to solve analytically. And then it turns out that uh, this inclusion of the infolding observer has a rather drastic effect on the entanglement structure of the black hole. Here, I would like to just simply introduce this uh, black hole decoupling theorem 
Um, this theorem holds under the three assumptions. Um, the first, I'm going to assume that black hole is unitary evolving. Um, I think it's an important assumption. Um, the second, I will assume that the black hole is scrambling in a sense that out of time order the correlation function decay. So this just roughly says that the uh, uh, time separation is roughly equal to or larger than the scrambling time. The third assumption is the following. I'm going to assume that the Hilbert space dimension of A, the involving observer, is larger than or equals to the Hilbert space dimension of the outgoing mode. And later, I will give a little bit of more um, justification of this assumption. But the point is, under these three assumptions, you can rigorously prove that uh, the quantum state, the reduced density matrix on B, uh, uh, sorry, D, B bar, decoupled into a tensor product. And the proofs are shown in these two papers, basically. So, but what does this mean? Um, well, this means something very interesting. Um, that is, um, so the first of all, um, D was of course entangled with the other side of the black hole originally, but it's no longer uh, because, well, it's tensor product, right? D is tensor product with B bar. So D is no longer entangled with B bar. Instead, D should be entangled with A bar A and C. Now here the point is that the A bar and the C are all the degree of freedom living on left-hand side of the black hole. So here I draw some Penrose diagram, try to capture this uh, situation. So at the beginning, the partner mode was RD, that is on living on the right-hand side. But when Alice crossed the horizon, somehow it seems that this partner mode dynamically changed to D tilde which is living somewhere in A bar A and C, and it is a left-hand side degree of freedom. This means that this Penrose diagram is actually not really a good thing, and then um, something drastic has happened along the trajectory of Alice. So given this information, let us deduce what is actually the good bulk effective description. Okay, now we have two important clues. First is, a and RD, well, should not encounter inside the black hole if you think that, uh, well, two sides are not coupled with each other. That's one thing. And the second thing is that uh, this D tilde, a new partner mode, is different from the original mode. With these uh, information in mind, we can actually uh, notice that uh, the correct bulk effective description can be obtained by treating. Um, the involving observer herself as a shock wave or back reaction. So here I just simply shifted the horizon accordingly. Then the point is that in this shifted um, parallel diagram, Alice uh, encounter a uh, detailed mode, the newly generated uh, partner mode shortly after she crossed the horizon. The point is what she will see is not RD, but it's a new mode. So that means that like, uh, um, Alice will not see RD at all. However, maybe some audience may think that A will, Alice will eventually encounter RD according to this diagram. But this is actually due to the kind of misleading nature of the Penrose diagram. In fact, this would be encounter between A and RD happens very, very close to the uh, singularity. And then, uh, there is, of course, no strong reason to believe any prediction that is coming from the black hole singularity or nearby. So from this, uh, uh, I think um, it is reasonable to suspect that uh, it's actually A will never encounter RD at all. So it seems to me that the correct bulk effective description for this Alice uh, involving observer is actually to effectively view these red lines as a black hole singularity. Anyhow, the point is that uh, Alice will see a new partner mode, which is different from RD because of this decoupling phenomenon. Okay, so far I have argued that the interior operator somehow changes dynamically from RD to D, D, D tilde, sorry, D tilde, due to back reaction. In fact, uh, it is possible to give explicit construction of interior operators. 
And here, uh, our goal is to find which mode D is entangled with inside A bar E and C. And interestingly, this problem of constructing interior operator can be viewed as the hidden prescue problem or the information loss problem, but running backwards in time. Now here in this slide, I'm just going to give you a intuition on why it is backward. And then I do not want to go into technical details, so I will just probably uh, very brief. But the point is the following. Uh, let us first rotate this quantum circuit diagram and make the time flow opposite, okay? So I just rotated the figure 180 degree. And then I also bend that arrows accordingly, like nicely in a suitable way. Anyhow, after doing this, what we obtain is the following physical situation. We had the outgoing mode, which is coming out from the black hole. But if you reverse the time flow, then outgoing mode is sort of returning back to the black hole. Then you can interpret this like returning mode as an input state in the Hayden Prescott thought experiment. Then this reconstruction problem um, has the same structure as the Hayden Prescott uh, recovery problem. And here C actually plays the role of early radiation and the informing observer plays the role of uh, uh, late radiation in the Hayden Prescott thought experiment. Now, it is a very well-known fact that uh, scrambling or decay of out of time order the correlation function implies recoverability, recoverability in Hayden Prescott thought, ex thought experiment. So by using um, the Hayden Prescott recovery protocol or traversable one hole protocol due to Gao and Jefferies and Wall, uh, depending on the time scale you are interested in, you, you are able to write down like interior operators explicitly. Now, I will refrain from actually writing down the expression here, but uh, this expression actually has a nice and uh, beautiful interpretation from the perspective of uh, operator growth and so on. But anyway, the take takeaway message is that uh, uh, interior reconstruction is actually a backward Hayden Prescue problem. Okay, now uh, having reviewed the uh, uh, interior reconstruction, uh, I would like to proceed to the resolution of the puzzle. So I will begin with the Saskin's protocol. But I guess by now, I think it is probably obvious to all of you that this. Uh, this protocol does not work simply because an informing observer will not see the signal that is coming from the other side of the black hole when two sides are not coupled. Okay. So again, the naive prediction from this original Penrose diagram just simply becomes invalid due to uh, back reaction. One may still ask if coupling two sides may help two signals to encounter inside the black hole. Um, that's a reasonable guess. And uh, indeed, by using the Hayden Prescue recovery protocol or traversable one hole protocol, we can force these two signals to meet inside the black hole. But the point is, in order to apply these protocols, you need to restore the system back to simple states, such as Thermofield double state. So then you are required to solve the original difficult problem on the boundary. So there will be no computational speed up. Okay, anyway. The more tricky one is the, uh, the boland pfefferman bazilanitz protocol. Now, here for simplicity of discussion, I will continue assuming that two sides of the black hole are not coupled. Now, their protocol requires a pair of observers to send signals to each other to measure the volume or length. Then here, uh, we, are, we already argued that uh, these observers should come from the same side of the black hole in order to communicate. So now let's assume that, uh, let's imagine that uh, there's one observer, observer Alice, who jump into the black hole, and then there's another one, Bob, later jump into the black hole, and then Alice tries to communicate with Bob after crossing the horizon by sending a signal to Bob. Then the question is, can Alice uh, send a message to Bob or not? And uh, this problem was actually already discussed by Hayden and Prescue. And uh, I think many people are familiar with this argument, but uh, the argument goes as follows. If the time separation between uh, Alice and Bob is longer than the scrambling time, 
Alice will need a large amount of energy because she has actually a very short amount of time to send a message to Bob. Because of that, uh, her energy should be larger than the uh, Planck energy. Um, then otherwise, uh, Bob will reach the singularity before Alice's message arrives. Therefore, two observers will not be able to communicate with each other um, unless their time separation is very short. So this argument seems to suggest that, that there is some fundamental upper bound on the efficiently measurable volume or length near the horizon. And uh, I really love this beautiful argument. And this is the very argument which gave the first sort of um, derivation of the scrambling time lower bound. But uh, um, from a modern viewpoint with these back reactions and so on in, in mind, uh, I feel actually that uh, the argument is not a precise or correct description of actual physics that is happening here. And this is a very subtle point, but in order to see this point, uh, let us consider the effect of back reaction from Alice more explicitly. Now let's suppose that Alice is planning to use S bar, some behind the horizon mode S bar to send a signal to Bob. Okay. But the point is when she crossed the horizon, S bar, which was originally a partner of S, is no longer a partner mode anymore because their entanglement will be gone. Instead, there will be new partner mode S tilde appears. As a result, uh, no matter what Alice does on S bar, it doesn't affect Bob at all because Bob is waiting to receive a signal uh, along this S tilde degree of freedom. In fact, because of this shift on the horizon, you can see that Alice's message will just fall into the singularity. Okay, so the point here is uh, while I have arrived at the, at the same conclusion as Hayden and Preskill, there is a very subtle and important difference. The reason why Alice cannot communicate with Bob is because Alice has introduced significant back reaction to the geometry by simply falling into the black hole. So namely this phenomenon occurs automatically regardless of whether Alice has attempted to send a signal or not. So I believe that this is a more like a little bit more modern and refined version of the Hayden Preskill's observation. Anyway, um, going back to the uh, original possible protocol of the uh, measurement of the volume, um, I'm just arguing that it is not possible to measure a very long wormhole length. Okay, so now finally, I would just like to make a very brief comments on some different scenarios for resolution of this complexity puzzle. And uh, well, first proposal is I think uh, proposed by Saskend and uh, it is based on the black hole complementarity like approach. And uh, roughly speaking, it goes in the following manner. That is, uh, well, maybe infolding observer can actually determine V and then, but she cannot communicate the answer back to the outside. But it's fine because the violation of the thesis cannot be verified from outside. And I guess uh, this uh, viewpoint was the, precisely the title of his paper that this horizon may protect the charge Turing thesis. But uh, this, I do not think this is the right resolution of the problem because I think the point is that in foreign observer really cannot determine the volume efficiently. So, and the violation of the thesis simply did not happen. So there's nothing we need to protect it from like anything. But another, I think, interesting counter argument against this uh, black hole complementarity like approach uh, can be obtained uh, um, in the following manner. So uh, it's actually, uh, it turns out that uh, um, so you can, so in following observer, Alice, so the, the point is we can ask Alice if she was hit by a black hole or not, by saving her from the black hole. It turns out there is a, a way to save Alice from a black hole by some quantum operation that is strictly localized on one side of the black hole. And actually it uses, the, it, this is exactly how we can reconstruct interior operator in the backward Hayden-Preskill protocols. Anyhow, the point is that uh, 
um, this whole procedure of saving Alice does not really depend on the other side of the black hole. So my guess is like most likely she will say that uh, she will she was not hit by a shock wave. Anyway, anyway. Okay, so then another. Uh, let me move on to another proposal for the resolution. Um, this proposal was mentioned by uh, Boland, Feferman, and Bazirani. I guess they just mentioned this possibility as a logical possibility, but uh, they mentioned that maybe the holographic dictionary is complex. And my own interpretation of this statement is that uh, is a possibility that uh, maybe one task is difficult on the boundary, but it could be easy on the bulk meaning that complexity is not really preserved under the holographic mapping. Now, I have already argued against this scenario by showing that the difficult problem remains difficult on bulk. But it is actually quite instructive to look at our proposal from the uh, perspective of the holographic dictionary. So there's a very important implication from the black hole decoupling theorem is the following. Um, it turns out that the construction of the interior partner mode is independent from the initial state of the black hole. In other words, it is state independent. In fact, the same expression of the interior partner mode works for any initial state of the black hole, including one-sided or two-sided black hole. Okay, that is good, but uh, it is actually important to emphasize that, however, that the construction of the interior operator depends on the initial state of the infolding observer. So therefore it is observer dependent. Then this observation suggests that actually the holographic dictionary, what we call holographic dictionary is not the invariant object. It changes dynamically by back reaction from infolding observer. So the point is we need to keep using the correct dictionary to make a correct prediction. Therefore, I believe that uh, uh, their arguments can be avoided by noting that this uh, observer dependent nature of the black hole interior. Okay. Okay, so that is uh, um, the resolution I propose. Um, okay. Now, finally, uh, let me well conclude with some discussions. So here I would like to uh, just point out that uh, our argument or our resolution actually also provides a uh, um, resolution to another important conceptual puzzle, namely the firewall puzzle. So let me just briefly recall why. So, um, so he, basically, the, this is how the AMP thought experiment works. Uh, let us consider an old black hole, which has already emitted half of its content. So black hole is maximally entangled with the early radiation. So then in this situation, the outgoing mode is entangled with RD, the other side of the black hole, or R radiation. However, uh, this is strange because um, when Alice jump into the black hole, Alice should be able to see uh, interior mode, D tilde. But then D cannot be entangled with RD and D tilde simultaneously. And then, so that is the uh, origin of the problem. And then there have been some several proposals which argue that uh, 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 this D tilde mode is actually the same as RD mode. And then in this approach, um, they try to resolve this puzzle by saying that maybe if, when you touch RD degree of freedom, uh, this perturbation sends us a deadly shock wave to Alice, and then Alice will be killed near the horizon. So she will not be able to see the interior mode. However, um, at least this scenario uh, is not consistent with the uh, scrambling phenomena of the black hole because this decoupling theorem, which is just simply based on uh, scrambling property of the black hole, it says that when ice jump into the black hole, uh, simply this outgoing mode is decoupled from the other side of the black hole and then she will have her own interior partner mode. Then she, she is free to enjoy her own smooth, no drama, uh, horizon on the interior. So this is our resolution of the firewall puzzle. Now I believe that this resolution is quite natural because it works for the firewall puzzle formulated for the one-sided black hole, namely the puzzle for typical black hole microstate, which was of course uh, originally uh, 
this problem was originally pointed out by Marlow and Polchinski. But the point is the same construction works for one-sided black hole. Anyway, so um, yes. Uh, so we have a comment question uh, from the chat mm -hmm. uh, from Abinav. So the uh, comment is showing that a task is hard from both the bulk and the boundary points of view does not rule out the possibility that the mapping is complex. Could you elaborate on how you, your rule, how you rule out that the dictionary is complex? In order to do so, you should show that an easy task on one side cannot map to a hard task on the other. Easy task on the which? Easy task on the boundary or bug? Um, Hi, uh, I maybe. suppose you can take either way. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so okay. I just wanted to I just wanted to see if you can elaborate on the on how you rule out that the dictionary between the bulk and the boundary is complex, because I think you said that you show that hard tasks remain hard. But, yeah, so but that right, doesn't so, mean that the dictionary cannot be complex, right? So, um, so first of all, I really don't understand what it really means by holographic complex. Uh, holographic dictionary is highly com complex. I don't really understand what this sentence means. My own interpretation of this sentence is that uh, well, the complexity or difficulty of the problem does not change on bulk and boundary. Now, this uh, extended quantum uh, this, this thesis uh, says that a difficult problem remains difficult on the bulk. Okay. Now, um, uh, so difficult problem on the bulk remains difficult on the uh, yes, yes, bulk. Then the opposite direction is actually pretty easy to show. Uh, you need to show that the easy problem on the boundary remains easy on the bulk, and then well. You can just bring your quantum computer to a very uh, flat region of the gravity, and you can just do the computation, and you can solve the problem. The point is, um, well, bulk has access to quantum gravity, so its computational power should be at least the same as the uh, quantum computer. Right? So I interpreted this uh, uh, extended charge Turing th uh, thesis as a statement that uh, when you map between bulk and boundary, the complexity really doesn't change much. But of course, I don't have any quantitative uh, uh, okay. statement concerning this, but uh, that is, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. So anyhow, so, right. Yeah, so uh, where am I? Yeah, so, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I, I just said that because of the, this, uh, this, this entangling phenomena, um, the other side of the black hole really doesn't play any role. So this um, resolution works for one-sided black hole firewall puzzle too, um, so which is, I think, quite nice. Anyhow, so this is how uh, one could potentially resolve the firewall puzzle. And uh, uh, I was quite satisfied with this resolution until recently, but since I started studying this uh, quantum extended charge Turing thesis, I decided to revisit this resolution from the perspective of the uh, computational complexity. And uh, yeah, I must confess that at the beginning, I was a bit puzzled. And uh, I want to share my puzzle. And uh, also, I want to share you how I get over this puzzle. <laughs> but anyway, so the puzzle I encountered was basically the following. Um, by jumping into the black hole, presumably, Ice will be seen in the interior mode well, just by falling into the black hole. Then I think this is something easy to do because she just jump into the black hole. But on the boundary, boundary CFT or boundary quantum mechanics, reconstructing interior operator is not necessarily easy. Uh, namely, at late times, the best known algorithm uses Grover search. Uh, this was done in my paper with Alexei. But uh, the point is, uh, this is not efficient at all. So then it seems that, uh, well, constructing an interior operator is very difficult on the boundary, but seeing it is very easy 
on the bulk. Then I was worried if this thesis is actually violated. But then um, I came to a tentative uh, resolution. Um, and then this is a bit spe speculative, but uh, my current uh, tentative resolution of this puzzle is the following. Let's assume that uh, well, time separation is longer than the scrambling time. Then it turns out that Alice will encounter the uh, interior uh, mode very close to the horizon. And it's very, very close to the horizon in a sense that it is actually less than Planck scale close to the horizon. Well, that is crazy because such short distance physics should not be not should not be visible to importing observer. And I believe that such models should be actually viewed as a part of the geometry itself. And then this reorganizing the matter fields into geometry may happen due to some short distance quantum gravity effect. But the point is, this degree of freedom is not easy to see. And on the boundary, in this time scale, you know, reconstruction with interior operator seems to be very difficult. On the other hand, when the time scale is shorter than the scrambling time, Alice will encounter the interior mode slightly away from the horizon. It's not like Planck length scale. Then, well, such, it's, such mode will be probably realized as a matter of field freely propagating on the fixed background geometry. The point is, these are probably easy to see. You can just put some particle number detector or something and you can see it. And on the boundary, it turns out that the reconstruction of this interior operator in this time scale is efficient. You can use traversal wormhole protocols to do that. And it's interesting to note that uh, these protocols work very well due to the fast scrambling nature of the black hole. That is the fact that uh, it's the upper exponent is two pi over beta. So for these reasons, I speculate that uh, it's actually the thesis is not violated. And then I think the interesting way of resolving it is to note that uh, depending on the complexity or the time scales, uh, the corresponding object on the uh, bulk is different. Um, on one hand, you have geometry, and on the other hand, you will have matter fields. So this is my uh, speculation. And uh, I think this is a kind of an interesting way of thinking because um, I was not super satisfied with my original resolution of the firewall puzzle because, well, it didn't really utilize the fact that the black hole scrambles quantum information in the fastest possible manner. As you know, after all, a piece of burning wood will scramble quantum information at late times. But this new version of the puzzle, I was confused. Um, naturally calls for the fact that the black hole is the fastest scrambler in nature. And then the decoding complexity, like efficient and inefficient decoding complexity seems to correspond to different objects on the bulk side. Anyhow, here is the summary and the future problems. So um, obviously I have argued that the proposed protocols are not feasible due to back reactions. And I have argued that the interior operator reconstruction can be understood as a backward Hayden rescue program. And in, in fact, uh, this uh, black hole decoupling theorem is very powerful and then you can actually easily show the robust encoding of interior operators and so on very easily from this theorem. And also I have sort of a, um, presented a kind of refinement of the Hayden Presky argument. And also I have made some speculation about a possible strengthening of the firewall puzzle and its possible resolution. Now, some future programs. Um, I am very interested in whether this is violated or not in digital space. Um, obviously, the normal DSCFT correspondence would map the system to non-unitary CFTs. So it's, well, a non-unitary CFT is unreasonably powerful. So I don't think these are the uh, good way of uh, attacking and, uh, and addressing this question. But um, yeah, but this is something I'm very interested. And it seems to me that uh, switching to other observers rest frame is quite non-trivial in the presence of black hole horizons. And I really want to understand this more precisely. And uh, so the third comment is more like my apology. That is, uh, I was not aware of uh, this paper. Um, 
um, which addresses a similar question. That is, they uh, said that uh, uh, measuring the entropy on the boundary is difficult, but measuring the entropy is easy on the bulk. And so it's uh, so they pointed out that a similar puzzle applies to the entropy. So I'm hoping to address uh, this version of the puzzle in the next version of my paper. And then also, um, I, it's a bit speculative, but uh, as you know, there's this parallel universe program in car geometry, that is you can jump to other universe and so on in car. Um, this is, I think, crazy. I mean, it would be nice if it's true, but I feel it's crazy to be true. And maybe if you consider the back reaction into account, then maybe you can resolve this puzzling feature. Um, but I, I think the whole point of my paper is that uh, I want to come up with a way to uh, regulate the Hilbert space of the black hole interior. Um, it seems that the um, black hole interior is huge and it seems it can hide so many things. But uh, it seems that uh, there is a way to dynamically regulate the blowing up of the Hilbert space dimension inside a black hole. Okay. Anyhow, so that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, Benny, thank you very much uh, for your talk. We still have uh, plenty of time for questions. So if you have any, please unmute and speak up. So, 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 hey, Benny, so, so I have a question. Uh, so, so can you, can you comment briefly on uh, using a single observer uh, instead of, uh, so you, you didn't talk about the possibility of using multiple copies of your, of your states oh, uh, yeah. and measure the statistical errors and instead of uh, instead of using a single copy and a single and introduce mm -hmm. the server. But I think um, I think in your so I am also not that familiar with the BFW paper, but I roughly remember that they have uh, commented mm -hmm. on this. So maybe introducing multiple copies will make your story uh, better, but uh, uh, I, I right. hope if you could comment on this or not. So, so, right. So the original paper by BFE does use multiple copies, but uh, in my understanding, uh, their protocol does not really exploit the full power of uh, having multiple copies of the uh, system. That is my understanding. That being said, it is quite possible that by having access to multiple copies of the system, maybe there is actually a efficient way of uh, um, determining the volume. What efficient means like, I believe that it's efficient to the extent that still the thesis is not really violated, but that is a possible thing. Now, um, the, I, I want to make two speculative comments on this. First is that, uh, um, um, so interior reconstruction program, um, the, the interior reconstruction algorithm uh, I and uh, Kitai came up with, uh, it uses a global search like algorithm as a subroutine. And then global search algorithm calls for uh, like multiple samples. So maybe um, by coupling different uh, gravity systems really nicely and then somehow implement this global such like structure, maybe there is a sh slight shortcut to determine the uh, volume. That might be possible. Also, BFV considers multiple shock wave geometry. And then multiple shock wave geometry is also really closely related to using multiple copies of the system. So I think it's actually a very interesting yeah, future program to think about like ensemble averages and so on in these stories. But unfortunately, I do not have any concrete result to share. Okay, thank you. Benny, we have a question in the chat from Sheng Liang. Will the back reaction introduce or affect the thermodynamic properties of the black hole? Right, so, um, that is a, uh, um, so uh, that's, I, I have a very long answer to this question. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, the, 
we want to part of the system in a way that it doesn't really change the thermodynamic property of the black hole, namely that uh, um, we want to be in a regime where uh, the temperature really doesn't change and then we can still live in the same uh, black hole Hilbert space and then we can still use the same Hamiltonian of the black hole and so on. But the, um, ultimately, I think this is a question of like, what is the imploring observer in this setup? Now, um, the point is that uh, in order to describe the physics of the uh, near the horizon, um, there are a bunch of outgoing modes. So uh, I think it is very reasonable to think that the informing observer herself should carry uh, as much entropy as outgoing mode. So that is, I think, the uh, reason why informing observer should carry some amount of Hilbert space dimensions. But in my understanding, or in my speculation, this informing observer should be actually understood as informing mode. Because in the ADS black hole, where you put perfect mirror on the boundary, uh, informing mode and the outgoing mode are essentially balanced. So they have roughly the same amount. Then we are trying to fix the initial state of the informing matter and then try to uh, characterize its response on, on the outgoing mode. I think that is the, um, that is the key. And uh, so basically, uh, uh, the informing observers, uh, informing modes, are degree of freedom on the like a uh, um, matter field, and it's not a geometric degree of freedom or not like high energy, high energy things. So it's more like a low energy, uh, yeah, soft modes. So yeah. So that is my. So so yeah. So ideally, we should work on a regime where thermodynamic properties doesn't change much. Yeah, so that's my answer. We still have some time for more questions before the informal uh, session. Yes, I had a question actually. Uh, mm -hmm. This is Eric. Uh, yeah, nice uh, talk. Uh, I also have a question about, uh, yeah, you assumed actually this um, church Turing thesis actually in your argument, and didn't you somewhere simply already argue that you could have a, a quantum uh, description to, uh, um, well, you, first of all, you, you show that this entanglement is being swapped by the infalling uh, observer. And then you sort of need the back reaction to explain this. So the argument almost seems the other way around, that you can assume uh, this church Turing uh, thesis, and then maybe you can argue that there should be a back reaction. Is there some way uh, to make your argument like that? Uh, uh, I see, I see, I see. I see, I see, I see. Huh. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Huh, I see. Well, yeah, I personally strongly believe that uh, this thesis should not be violated, so I could try to use it to derive something, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the arc, <laughs> am I right that you need the back reaction to save the thesis? Am I right? That's sort of yes, yes, right. yes, De definitely, definitely. Uh, so but, I'm uh, asking then, can you also use it as an ansatz and then derive what the back reaction should be? Mm, right. Uh, I, I think in principle, it might be possible. But uh, I mean, I, I feel that's a very interesting point and I never thought of it. So I don't think I can give a any intelligent answer, but okay. yeah, I, I think that's a very yeah, interesting point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I see. Mm. I see. Any more questions? Okay, uh, we have another question from Scott Aronson. If we assume the QECT, can we conclude only that something has to block the BFV proposal? Could be back reaction, could be something else? Could be back reaction or something else, right. Yeah. So 
yeah, it could be something else. And then that's why uh, I still don't know, uh, starting from the thesis, I don't know how to really arrive at the back reaction picture. Like the reason why I suspect back reaction is important is because it has played so many important roles in the black hole conceptual puzzle art puzzles. So yeah, but uh, right. So logically, I think it's a possibility that there could be some other possibility. Yeah, but practically, I feel that I'm, it's pretty safe to say that the back reaction is the key. And then, um, but sometimes uh, the point is that uh, well, when we treat quantum back reactions, uh, presumably we will probably using this shockwave pictures and so on. But uh, this this is very subtle in a sense like if two signals are coming into the black hole from two sides, I don't know which one should be treated as a gravitational shock wave and so on. Then this is a very subtle problem. And then if you only look at the bulk, then um, there is no um, good guiding principle to proceed. So I think it's actually uh, the, this thesis may be a good uh, guiding principle to deduce what is actually the correct form of the back reaction after on the uh, black hole geometries and so on. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Which may be actually a bit related to Eric's question. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's my answer. Any last question? Well, if not, let's unmute uh, ourselves and uh, thank Benny for this nice talk.